Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Esther, Esther in chapter number three. And um, Esther, I really considered, um, <clears throat> let's see, how do I say this? I hope you're ready for a, de a depressing message. <laughs> okay, because it is fairly depressing, okay? Uh, we were over in Orlando this past weekend for the marriage conference, and, uh, you know, there's Disneyland's over there, and, and a couple folks went over to ate at some of the Disneyland restaurants, and, and that's pretty neat, and kids love going to Disneyland. I don't know if parents love going to Disneyland, but kids love going to Disneyland. And, uh, you know, the concept in, 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 uh, behind Disney is, and they all lived... Yeah. That's not necessarily the way it is. And the concept is this. Listen, good always defeats bad. And if you're good, everything works out. Well, in, in, in an eternal sense, that's true. There's coming a day when we will live happily. But not even ever after, because there's no time. <laughs> we, will, we will be in heaven for all eternity. And all the tears will be wiped away. And all the pain will be gone. And that's a blessing. I don't want to diminish that promise, okay? That's, that's really the promise we have to cling to, because the reality about this life, when you face circumstances, it's not necessarily that everybody lives happily ever after. And most of those fairy tale movies, you know, especially in our modern society, at the end of the movie, even the bad guy goes, oh, okay, I guess you're right. Let's get along. And that's not the way it is. And uh, we see that when we're looking at the book of Esther, kind of the angle that we're going at from looking at the book of Esther is how to live in a world that has forgotten God. And we live in a world that has forgotten God. So how do we live in a world that has forgotten God? And to be honest, I think uh, Mordecai and Esther are good examples because if you are looking for uh, biblical heroes, it probably wouldn't be these two. Partly because they, they potentially could have gone back to Jerusalem. They could have left and went back and lived exactly where God wanted to. It's not like they are operating at optimum level of walking in obedience to God. They're struggling through life. We're living in a world that has forgotten God. And so tonight, the idea, the concept is... When, it is it, when is it right to stand for God, and when I stand for God, does everything turn out all right? When is it right to stand for God, or stand for what I believe, and when I do stand, does everything turn out all right? And so let's look and see what it says, chapter number three, beginning in verse number one. The Bible says, after these things did Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Haman, that guy, uh, the Agite, and advanced him and set him uh, uh, his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgress, transgress thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, he hearkened not unto them that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then Haman was full of wrath and sought to scorn, and he thought scorn to lay hand on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. Let's pray, Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, as we look at this portion of Scripture, Lord, that you would just give us wisdom. Lord, I know that the, these are not necessarily uh, the, the most shining examples and there are shining examples in Scripture and, and where your power is made evident in response to proper stances. And you can do that, but you don't always do that. 
And I pray that you'd help us, Lord. We live in a world that has forgotten God. And uh, sometimes we are bashful. Sometimes we are negligent in our responsibilities. Sometimes we are deficient in our walk. Sometimes we become so temporally minded, we have to be shocked back into reality. And I pray that you'd help us. In Jesus' name, amen. When you think about standing for God, you know, there's some pretty incredible examples in the scripture. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, you're going to bow down. They said, we will not bow. They were brought before the king, and the king is full of anger. And he, and he says, are you going to bow down? And they say, we are not careful to answer thee, O king. Hey, God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. Pretty incredible. They're thrown into the fiery furnace there. Even the guards that threw them were consumed with the fire. They get burnt, thrown into the fire, and even that which bound them burned off. They were liberated to walk in the fire, and God's son's very presence was there amongst them. What an incredible thing. You're like, man, I'm going to stand for God, and this is going to be awesome. This is going to be incredible. And they're going to say this and say that. They're going to bind me, take me, and throw me. And God's going to show up, and whoo we're going to win. Sometimes God does that. Sometimes God doesn't do that. Sometimes it's not quite that easy. When do we stand for God? Well, first let's talk about the legitimacy. And we're going to, I want to get the legitimacy of his stand out of the way first. And then we can talk about it practically because we may not be standing for the very same reason. When you're watching this, you, we know about Haman, uh, Haman post story, don't we? We know what a vicious person he was. We know what a vindictive person he was. What an angry person. What a person that relished in the destruction of others. I mean, he's just a vicious, vicious person. We know that post story. We could make some assumptions. That Mordecai may know that at this point in the story, but we have no evidence that he did. The only thing that we have is that the king has placed him, in essence, as a prime minister over all the princes and, and says, hey, when this guy comes through, you need to bow. In this culture, in this day and age, don't think of a, like of a medieval bow or, or, or some sort of chivalrous bow. This is on all hands, uh, uh, hands and feet like a dog before them. And Mordecai says, I will not bow. And the first thought is, he knows Haman's character, and so he will not bow. But there's a problem with that, because it's not like he's surrounded with a lot of good character. It's not like Hazarus is, is, is a man of morals, right? So it doesn't seem like Haman's deficiencies are the reason that Mordecai is not bowing. It doesn't seem like he has a problem with the politics of it, the position that he's been given. There's one thing that is made very clear when they start pressing him, why won't you bow? Why won't you bow? And eventually they'll go uh, to Haman and say, he will not bow. Let me tell you why he will not bow. He has revealed to us he's a Jew. In essence, he wouldn't, could not bow before Haman under the law any more than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could bow under the law. And we celebrate Shadrach, uh, those guys. We celebrate them for not bowing because we see the glorious effect. And here we almost read Mordecai. It's like, guy, dude, why are you making such a big deal? Same law. Same law. Even though they were in different positions in some way, even though Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there not so much of their own volition, probably the sins of their parents had placed them in that position as the young were taken uh, with Daniel and those uh, that were seeming to be of benefit and they had been trained. It was not so much their sin that had placed them there, but their father's sin. And here's Mordecai. It's very possible that he could have, should have gone back to Jerusalem. We could even say he was not even in the best place of where he should have been. Same law. It doesn't matter how good uh, that one was or how deficient the other was. Same law. To be under the law and to be right with the law, he could not bow. 
And so you can see their confusion as they're watching everybody get down on all fours like, like a dog groveling uh, before his master. And there's Mordecai who will not bow. And the servant's like, why aren't you bowing? Why aren't you bowing? There's been some, uh, some thought, and I think at some level there's some credence to it, uh, that uh, perhaps he should not have hid that he was a Jew, but he did. And so they're like, why aren't you bowing? This doesn't make any sense. Why would you go against the king's commandment? Where in truth, he's going against the king's commandment because there is a greater commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So they say it to him every day. What are you, what are you doing? You're going to get in trouble. What are you doing? And he finally has to say to them, I can't bow. I'm a Jew. It would go contrary to the law of God. It would go contrary to the worship that I have that should be before God. And he makes the stand. So the reason I bring that up is because this is not seemingly a frivolous stand of a person that has an animosity or a vendetta of one towards another, and I'm not going to respect you. I'm not going to give you reverence. I'm not going to acknowledge your authority. It's not about that. At least at this point, it's not about that. It is, I cannot bow and be right with God. I cannot bow and maintain my status under the law. It is unlawful for me to bow, just as it was for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the, the stand is legitimate. And we would have some legitimate stands. Though we ourselves may not have the same, obviously, the same um, weight of the law upon us. Praise the Lord for grace. Amen? Amen? But we still have some principles in God's Word. And we still have some truths in God's Word that we know that if we do certain things, and if we allow certain things, it would go against the very conscience that God's Word is placed in our heart and placed in our life. And it's important that when you're going to take a stand, that you first analyze and ask yourself, is this a valid stand? Or is this a stand that is filled with vendetta? Is this a stand that is filled with animosity? Is this a stand that is filled uh, with, uh, with, with hurtfulness? Or is this a valid stand where I can say, according to the Word of God, I, I'm not going to engage in that. I'm not going to participate in that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to allow myself to be a part of that. And I'm going to take a stand. And I can, It's a valid stand. So we're operating upon the premise tonight of when we take a valid stand before God. A valid stand before God means it's something that can be clearly delineated in Scripture. A valid stand before God means it would clearly cause me to go against what God has led me to do. It may not even be something that says, thou shalt not, but there's a personal conviction that has developed. And you say, it is my conviction, according to the scripture, that I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to engage in that. And praise the Lord that we may not even all exceed the same on it, but I'm talking about a valid stand that I'm not going to do that. When do I take a stand for God? Well, here's the first thought I want you to think about. Is they, they took a stand for God, or he took a stand for God, even though his standing wasn't in the best place. In other words, if, from what I understand of Scripture, from the book of Ezra, from the book of Haggai, from the book of Zechariah, from the book of Nehemiah, God desired the children of Israel to return to Jerusalem. He wanted them to return. This is post-70 years. He wanted them to return. There was a call. Even Cyrus will make the call. It will be made uh, not only through Jeshua and Zerubbabel, but then made through Ezra, then made through Zechariah, and then also made through Nehemiah. That those would hear the Spirit of the Lord, let him arise up and return unto Jerusalem. So he's not even necessarily in the place that he should be. Sometimes we fail to take a stand for God because we don't think we're good enough Christian to take a stand. Oh, preacher, I, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I, I'm not a very good Christian, so I just went along with it. I'm not a very good Christian. I, I mean, I, I'm not somebody that can take a stand. I mean, I, I, I lose my temper and, and I get angry. And oh, let me just tell you, oh man, I struggle with this and struggle with that. And so it's just not, I'm not good enough to take a stand. Well, can I remind you of something? You never were, and you never will be. Right. Amen. 
The stand that you take is not based upon your righteousness. The stand that you take is based upon what is clearly given in Scripture. Yeah, but preacher, I, I believe if I do that, I, I'm going to be a little bit hypocritical. Welcome to being a Christian. Yeah, amen. That's right. Amen. If we had to give in to sin every time we were a hypocrite, then we might as well give in to sin all the time. Okay? Can I just tell you? Can I just help you with something? My whole life is dedicated to trying to allow God to help me be what I am not. Amen. But some of my life, I end up being what I am. Yeah. So while I'm trying to be what I'm not by the grace and power of God, sometimes I end up being what I am. And it just happens when you catch me. <laughs> you might see me over here. This is how I am. And then another day, you'll see me over here. This is who I want to be. And you're like, yesterday you were over there. Today you're over here. Yeah, I know. Well, praise God. I hope it's called sanctification. Amen. Well, you can't be over here because you were over there. We are never going to find ourselves to be righteous, righteous enough to take a stand upon our righteousness. That's why the stand has to be taken upon the principles of God's word. Amen. And my stand ultimately is my stand. Okay, that is given to me by Scripture. And some of them are, are very, very clear. Some of them are very, very clear. And you stand in a classroom or, or you stand at a workplace and somebody asks you a question like, you, do you believe that God created the heavens and the earth in six literal days? Absolutely. Oh, you think you're smarter than all the scientists? No. But I think God is. I think God is. So I take my stand. I mean, it's just, it's just right there. You, you mean that you believe that Jesus Christ is God, very God, and he's the only way of salvation? There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved? Yes, that's the stand. Amen. Yeah, but I've seen you. You're a pretty horrible Christian. You think you're better than everybody else? No, I'm probably worse, but it doesn't change my stand. Because my stand is not based upon my righteousness. My stand is based upon the word of God. Amen. That's what it's based upon. Yes. So sometimes we think because we are frail or because we fail or because we're weak or because we don't do a good job demonstrating those things that we are not worthy to take the stand. The stand is not based upon your worthiness. The stand is based upon his worthiness. So here's Mordecai, a guy who probably should have been in Jerusalem, and if he would have been in Jerusalem, perhaps some of these things would not have happened to he and his family, but he's not in Jerusalem, so what does he do? He said, I still got to take a stand. Here's a guy that at some level, potentially, he was ashamed. He was fearful. Maybe he didn't tell them he was a Jew because he was fearful of the implications. And so he was bashful and he was shy. And he's like, I don't, I'm not going to tell him. But when he was confronted with, will you obey the law of God or will you go the way of the world? He said, I can't, I, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. And they asked him the first day, why, why are you standing? Listen, I just don't want to talk about it. And they asked him again, and they asked him again, and they asked him again, and they asked him again. They asked him. And finally, listen, I can't. I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. Maybe he was fearful that his stand would have negative implications on his personal situation, negative implications on his niece's situation, negative implications on all the Jews' situation. And he has to come to a decision. I can't take a stand based upon what perceives to be the outcome, positive or negative, I must take a stand based upon my understanding of what the law of God says. Amen. And he takes a stand. You're like, man, isn't that a feel-good story? That everything could go wrong, would go wrong, but he took a stand, and guess what happened? Everything went wrong. Everything went wrong. So don't refuse to take a stand because you're not the Christian you think you should be. Hey, go ahead and take a stand. It may be the first step to becoming the Christian you should be. Right. Second of all, don't be surprised if when you take a stand, 
They don't understand. They don't understand. That, that's the Disney story. He took his stand for what he believed in, and everybody said, oh, you're in trouble. I mean, we got problems here. This is not good. This came from the king. So then that began to be spread to Haman. And Haman became very wroth. And he became very upset. And that not only affected Mordecai, but if you read, this is basically what Haman said. This is so egregious that it is insufficient to just punish the one. I must punish all of them. I'm going to punish all of them. Mordecai's people. Wait, wait a second. He took a stand. Something good should happen at this point. But you've forgotten. You live in a world that's forgotten God. Now, can I tell you, praise the Lord, do we know the story? That months and months and months later, God's power would be revealed and God's people would be given a uh, ability to, to protect and care for themselves and God would ultimately bless that effort. But that's a long way off. And so here you are and you're having to, we were talking about this in Sunday school a little bit this morning, and God's laid a conviction in your heart according to the principles of God's word. There's some things that are beneficial and there's some things that are detrimental to you or to your family. And as a family, you've taken a stand and now you've gone to Thanksgiving or you've gone to Christmas or you've gone someplace and the rest of your family comes in and says, let's do this together. And you're like, our family doesn't do that. And they all understand. No, they don't understand. But that does not take away the validity of the stand. Their lack of their understanding doesn't take the validity that I'm not standing based upon how it pleases men. I'm standing based upon how it pleases God. Now, can I give you this quick caveat? This is based upon a biblically valid stand. It is possible to have a stand that may be religiously valid, or may be just personally valid, but is not biblically valid. And that's why we really want to take time to scrutinize God's word and say, is this a right stand? Okay. Is this a right stand? Sometimes they're not going to understand. So when they understand, first of all, don't refuse to take a stand because you're not the Christians you should be. Don't refuse to take a stand simply because uh, they're, you're afraid that they're not going to understand. They probably won't. Don't refuse to take a stand because what comes next, that out of a lack of understanding comes aggression. Man, look what it says. Here's in the passage. It says this in verse number six. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Hazarus, even the people of Mordecai. Man, aggression. Aggression. You know, you ever hear this, the saying, it takes, you have to hear both sides of the story? It, I, I've learned this over the years, that it, it is folly to answer a man according to, the Proverbs basically says, I'll paraphrase, it's folly to answer a man according to one side of the story. And you go into a job, and all of a sudden, they find out you're a Christian, and you take a stand, and guess what they say? Well, let me tell you what the last Christian did that was here. Now, is it possible that what they're saying is true? Of course it is. Is it possible that what they're saying is coming from bitterness and anger towards the fact that that Christian was just willing to take a stand? Of course it is. And so you might catch some negativity that comes to you because another Christian took a stand. Just hope it was a valid biblical stand. So here's the depressing thing. You need to take a stand even if you're not the Christian you should be. And when you do, they won't understand. Very typically. And when you do, they may get angry and aggressive towards you. That's it. <laughs> There's no, yeah, but, except for, praise the Lord, 
God is sovereign. He's in control. And he will keep account. And by his grace, one day he'll give you the means of protection and wisdom. But if he does not, he's given you himself. And he's given you heaven. I, I'd love to paint the picture a little rosier. That if you take a stand, you know, you're going to get promoted to that job. Maybe not. They may not understand. If you take a stand for what you believe to be right, your family is going to understand and they're going to, they're going to say, hey, we'll do it your way. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. But you're not taking a stand based upon the result of the reaction of the people that have forgotten God. You're taking a stand based upon your willingness and desire to not deviate from this book. And not, not allow yourself to, to, to go against what God's taught us. To say, this, this is what's right. This is what's right. I tell you, there's a lot of Christians that have decided it's easier just to go with the flow. It's easier just to go with the flow. It's easier just to meld in to become part of society when we have some very clear teaching in Scripture that Christians are supposed to be distinct and they're supposed to be peculiar, separate. They're supposed to be putting off the light of Christ. Now, let me point something out. In this passage, can I tell you, now we don't know the whole, this is just the narrative it gives us, but can I tell you the character that gets upset, bent out of shape, and wrathful in this? is Haman. At least from what we have been presented, it wasn't like Mordecai standing over there going, you're wicked, horrible, I would never do that. No, he's fairly silent. He's fairly silent. So the, the validity of that stand is not even based upon the condemnation that you would have on others, but the confirmation that what you're doing is what you believe God wants you to do. And that often is going to be done much better in a silent way than a very vocal way. It's not my goal to point out others who are not standing where I'm standing. It's my goal to make sure my stand is in accordance to God's word. Yeah. Right. And stand. Can I tell you who really struggles with this? Sometimes, sometimes it is... The people that have forgotten God or do not know God that struggle, they don't understand it. But sometimes they just chalk it up to, you're one of those religious fanatics. And they're fine with that. You know who really struggles with it? Is when a Christian is taking a stand, a strong biblical stand. And there are other Christians around him who are unwilling. Yeah. Right. Right. And they're like, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing what the Word of God says. What are you doing? <laughs> and it's important that to me, and maybe, maybe I don't want to read into this, but can I tell you, Mordecai was not the aggressor. He was not going to the other servants and going, you want to know why I'm not, I'm not bowing? You want to know why I'm doing this? Because I'm righteous and you're not. I'm holy and you're not. I'm great. And no, no, no. That's not what he was doing. And you might say he was doing that because he was fearful. Hey, that's fine. But can I tell you who ultimately he was fearful of? Defying the law of God. That's what he was fearful of. And so he takes this stand in a fairly passive way, and he says, I just can't do it. I will not do it. And those around him gave, did not understand. They brought that negativity. So if you take a stand for God, you will live happily ever after. When you get to heaven. Yeah, amen. Until then, it may seem a little bit hypocritical. But go ahead and obey God's word. Amen. Go ahead and obey God's word. Hey, it'll at least get you moving in the right direction. People will not understand. Sometimes there may be misunderstandings. There may be hurt feelings. Try to do it with as much grace as possible. Try to do it with as much love as possible. But take a stand. 
there may be some aggression. Who do you think you are? You think you're better than the rest of us? You think you're more holy than we are? No, no. I, in fact, I'm a miserable, rotten sinner with a wicked heart. But praise the Lord, I have a Savior who's forgiven all my sin and I have his grace and I do not want to go against his word. And it's true. I'd like, you know, what typically happens, these sort of messages, when you get done, the pastor says something like, and ultimately they'll respect you for it. <laughs> Probably not. No, it's possible that you might get bound and thrown into a fiery furnace and God himself will show up and take over the situation. Hey, praise the Lord if that happens. But more typically, we live in a world that's forgotten God. They're just not going to understand. They're going to be angry. They're going to feel judged. And let's make sure that that's coming from God's word and not coming from us. At least he had a place to take a stand. I wonder if you were thinking, I was very careful to not be specific as to what the stand is other than creation and the deity of Christ, okay? I wonder if there were some things that you were thinking, hey, that's a place where I would stand. That's clearly taught to me in Scripture. That's clearly taught to me in Scripture. One of the most dangerous things that we can have is Christians who are taking stands and they have no idea why. They don't know why. They've decided to take a stand. Anybody that comes to church wearing a polka dotted shirt is of the devil. Anybody wearing a polka dotted shirt? No. Okay. And they're taking their stand. Why are they taking that stand? Because their grandpa told them that anybody that came to church wearing a polka dotted shirt was of the devil. And bless God, it must be in the Bible there somewhere. And they're taking their stand, and they look around at all the polka dotted shirt people and say, Ugh. You don't even know why you're taking a stand. You look in the scripture, you're not going to find the anti-polka dotted chapter. Okay? <laughs> now, and there should be some fashion issues there, I don't know. But that's why it's responsible for every Christian to go back to this book and know the law of the Lord. Meditate on the law of the Lord. I say, brother, why are you taking the stand you're taking? He says, let me get my, script, let me get my Bible and I'll show you. Hey, why don't you do that? Well, well, let me show you the principles that God showed me in God's Word. Why do you do that? Well, let me show you the principles. Why, why, do, you, why do you go to church so much? Well, that's just what we do. Not a good stand. Well, if I didn't, the preacher would be upset. Not a good stand. I have to or my wife will get mad. Not a good stand. Let me take the Bible and tell you some principles of why. So we need to take a stand. And if you're going to take a stand like Mordecai took that has those negative ramifications, you better know why you're taking it. And that's your responsibility to know why you're taking it. Because it is not an excuse to say to God, oh, I didn't know. Because he's given you his book. So I thought, told you I'd give you a nice, warm, fuzzy message tonight. Take a stand for God and everything will turn out fine. Not really, but that makes you feel better. Take a stand for God because it's right. And when God is ready to elevate you and bless you and help you. And he can and he will. But it may be just the environment you live, the society that you live in, that you're just going to get the negative for a while. That's okay. God's worth it. It's just going to be a tribulation you can glory in. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord.